we got to figure out how to be in partnership with one another if we are going to ever survive this world and climate change. Welcome everyone. I could not be more excited to be here today with Whitney Clapper of Patagonia. Whitney, thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Yeah. I know we're going to get into sort of all the pieces, but let's just start a little bit with your background and what brought you to Patagonia, what brings you to your current role. I know folks are so interested in how people make the move into positions like yours. So just give us a little background. Yeah, that's always such a funny question because I definitely do not have the traditional background that one Mm. might expect. I grew up in the Midwest, always had a love for outdoors. I actually thought I was going to be an outdoor educator. I went the path of sociology and biology and and needed to kind of mix the the world where you debate forever with the kind of the practical facts of science. Mm -hmm. And that took me into what I thought would be kind of my career, which was outdoor education. But part of getting through school and part of kind of being where I was when I was growing up and kind of wrestling with all that was there was long runs, was long bike rides, was adventure. And so I always had this love of outdoors. And there just happened to be a moment in my life where kind of a job in the outdoor industry opened up. So Mm. I, I applied, even though I was absolutely not qualified on paper at all. Um, Mm. But luckily, my hiring manager somehow saw something in me, I was brought into the outdoor industry, worked my way through a couple of different brands. And essentially became brand managers for, for brands like Chaco Sandals for Patagonia mm-hmm. Footwear. And then that led me to Patagonia, kind of the, the clothing side of Patagonia. Mm-hmm. Um, at the time, there was not a brand team. There were product teams and kind of sport marketers, but there was not a brand team. So I helped start the brand team at Patagonia over six years ago. And that, that, was, that was kind of a somewhat random mix of projects. It was our, our food, our provisions had just started at that time. We had our warm wear program, which is our care and repair program. We had our films that was not yet a department of its own. We had books, we had in our Enviro, all of our Enviro advocacy work. So that all was kind of lumped into my work on the brand team. And quickly thereafter, we we discovered that each of these different pieces of the brand team just needed their own love and own teams and own budgets and all of that. So they got to be separated out a little bit from that moment. And I think I just, I had this, this kind of um, reality check when there was, was all on my plate that I wasn't doing any one of these divisions justice because mm-hmm. I was one person. I wasn't able to do as much work mm-hmm. as each of them needed. And so I... I didn't do the traditional kind of business route of a position as just the enviro marketer, which I shouldn't say just, it was, it's still a, a tremendous amount of work, but it felt like a just because I was taking away all of these other mm. parts of pieces. So became the enviro marketer, um, gosh, probably six or so years ago. And was doing that for a while up until this last year where we've had, you know, well, COVID life and pandemic life and lots of shifting and transitioning of kind of leadership and structures within Patagonia that I'm now actually gratefully not in marketing anymore. And now over on the Enviro team and our Enviro advocacy team and working to lead community engagement and impact from our Enviro perspective. So A little bit of a a wild journey in that most of my professional career in the outdoor industry, um, there were no templates to follow. I seemed to be the person that was plopped into new positions and they're like, figure it out. So I I was able (laughs) to do that at a lot of different brands, which taught me a lot and gosh, had me eat a lot of humble pie along the way. But here I am. I'm still at Patagonia seven years later and working on figuring out what it means for Patagonia to be in community? How do we show up? What is our position? What is our role? And a lot of work that's really centered more around actually centering people. We haven't always centered people in our efficacy and conservation work. So actually figuring out what it means to center people and what it means to be working with a lot of people that don't necessarily look like our common core. So a lot of BIPOC, a lot of LGBTQ plus groups and communities that aren't necessarily represented currently in kind of Patagonia Mm. colleague and structures. So it's exciting. It's good. It's fun. 
Wow. Okay. I have to choose which way I want to go, but I first want to say, I love that you shared a self demotion story because that is a part of my own story as well. And I don't hear a lot of people talk about that. And so I'm really grateful for you just sharing that piece of your journey. Okay. Let's start with, tell me a little bit about, and maybe this just goes right to the core of what you're currently grappling with and what you said there at the end around centering people, but even how you define community impact. What does that mean first to Patagonia? What does that term even mean? You know, in all honesty, I think we are in that very question. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I could speak for the company on what we mean by community impact. I think you talk to our sport teams, right? They are going to be focused on their sport, their athletes, their, you know, where Mm. the product that they're making for those people in those communities, that to me is a different impact than maybe the impact I'm focused on, which we actually have been working on values within our own Enviro department. And I was looking up, we have a value, it's not finalized, but it's down for impact. And right now we currently have it as regenerative, enduring impact is our North Star. Mm. We are committed to creating equitable change for people and planet. Our impact starts internally and radiates out to the partners and communities we serve. So still noodling on that. But to me, impact is this kind of nexus of it's this unification, right, of bringing people together, starting with people in our conservation efforts and working with people who are on the ground to help make the change needed for whatever it is that we are working on in that either that area or kind of for a bigger purpose of reversing climate change. There's a lot of different ways to define it. But to me, I think what we're looking at from an impact perspective is really working to make sure it's not just saving a wild place or Mm -hmm. a home planet that is void of kind of the reality and the people who are there and the people who have been there and the people that have been in these fights much longer than maybe most of us. So that's where I keep, I know I keep saying this, but kind of centering the people, bringing kind of the justice Mm. element back in to then make impact for the better, for change in the positive way. Mm. How has this shifted the way you sort of work or think about setting up partnerships? Like if you think about historically you know, you haven't been centering people and that shift in there. What does that look like on sort of a tangible level? It looks like a lot of conversation right now Mm -hmm. and head scratching. I mean, Mm -hmm. it looks like the reality is, I mean, there's not enough therapy in the world right now. I mean, I think Mm -hmm. like it is shifting mindsets, right? I mean, how do you convince people to move forward with regenerative practices and creating regenerative relationships when you are also working with a two week deadline, you know, for a marketing push or, you know, a ridiculous deadline that quite often exists in corporate culture, regardless of whether you're Patagonia or not. Right. And so I think this is what I'm sitting in right now. Right. We have been good at not intentionally extracting information from people, but I think very unconsciously, we've been in a lot of extractive relationships. And part of that is, you know, what we were kind of talking about before you hit record, but this balance of we are, as Patagonia, we're a funder for so many groups and nonprofits, Mm -hmm. right? And quite often, the stories that we're sharing, the films we're creating are centered around communities or places that we also have these nonprofit organizations, And so I think we're in this midst of how do we approach relationships with much more consciousness to needing to have kind of a before, during, Mm -hmm. maybe a, you know, a marketing PR push and then after, like, what is that continuum of our relationship that then gets us into this place of a regenerative partnership, not an extractive one. But that's the mind shift that is, Mm -hmm. we're needing to kind of figure out and, I'm one person. There are a few of us that, you know, I think are thinking very similarly, but we're a large company, like outdoor industry is a massive industry. Mm. So I don't know. Do you have tricks on like how to shift these mindsets? I mean, I think, (laughs) I think there's a lot of people that want to do the right thing, but it takes time, right? Some of Mm. my deepest relationships, it's because I've been there for 
five, six, seven years, right? So how do you kind of build this out and how do you kind of shift from extractive to regenerative? Mm -hmm. And there's so many more components that come from doing that, but I think that's a big piece of the pie right now. Yeah. I mean, I think something that you're highlighting here that's super important is that shifting takes time and is not just mindset shift, like a mindset shift for the grantor or the funding arm of the organization, but that there's this really complicated organization with not just mindsets, but standard operating procedures for a business. My, my husband does like change management work at a huge company. And it is wild to me when I see all the different pieces that he has to manage in order to change, to shift one process, right. To be more sustainable, for example. And kind of all the quality checks that go in and all the different, you know, voices to include. And so I think what you're talking about is something that's really complicated, but I think what's super important is that you aren't shying away from it. You're like, here we are, we're in this muck. We recognize that like, this has not been the exact type of relationship we've wanted to have or the impact we've wanted to make. And now we're trying to figure out, and maybe, you know, I would not call myself an expert on this at all. The way I think about it is that it's a process of learning together for the companies and the nonprofits in partnership, finding that alignment around, do you view partnership the same way? Do you view working together the same way? Do you want the same things? Are you value aligned? Can you sort of build this consistent piece in relationship, recognizing that and give each other real feedback along the way? Because I will have nonprofits tell me all the time, oh yeah, we have really strong relationships with these funders. And then they'll say something like, we don't feel like their, you know, reporting practices are very equitable and they're causing this and that problem in our organization. I'm like, okay, well, why in your next meeting with them, let's talk to them about that and figure out how we can improve that. Like, oh no, 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 we can't talk about that with them. And so I'm like, okay, so what does it mean then? Because a few days ago, you told me that you have a really strong relationship with them. So what does really strong relationship mean to you? Because when I think about like my personal, really strong relationships, if something in that relationship was not working, I would be able to talk to the other person about it, but that's not what really strong relationship means to you here. It sounds like. And so even I think that practice of defining, like, what does strong partnership look like, like in the funding moment, perhaps, but in the ongoing conversation, in the way that feedback can be, you know, delivered on both sides, the safety that's created around learning together. I'm curious what that's just sort of how I think about these pieces. I'm curious how that resonates with you. Yeah, no, I mean, I think I appreciate you bringing that up because I feel like we're in those same questions, right? And I Mm -hmm. think you were actually talking to Duke about this on a previous episode where there, I'll go out and I'll find someone on Twitter and be like, hey, I want to talk to you, right? And Mm -hmm. that's how I've made a lot of my connections. And I don't have a concern, you know, that they're not going to give me money or they're not, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm not in that position because I am on the company, you know, I'm on the corporate side. And I think when I'm entering into a conversation with a group that we've funded, I hope that they are okay to challenge me when I'm asking Mm -hmm. too much, when they just don't have time to take on what I'm asking for, if they just feel like it's too much right now. I hope that Mm -hmm. they would say that. But I also wonder if because we're Patagonia, we are a funder, are they going to bend over backwards for us, which is not equitable Mm -hmm. in any way. Right. And so I guess a strong relationship to me is an absolutely trust-based relationship that needs to start before where there are asks. So Mm -hmm. what does that look like? And what is that runway? You know, I'm trying to Mm -hmm. think about when we come out with films and we come out with even a blog or a social piece, right? Mm -hmm. What do we need to be, when should we be ideally entering into conversations and relationships before we make an ask? And then what's the follow-up to that? So the film goes live or whatever it is goes live. What happens afterwards? And I feel like in my role right now, I'm on the before and kind of the after Mm -hmm. side of it, right? To maintain. And it's because I'm now not in this marketing hot seat, right? Where I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm asking for things. I have the chance to give, which means I'm able to build more of these kind of trust 
faith-based relationships where I do feel like there is more honest conversation that's coming, but it doesn't always necessarily come depending on who's asking, right? If the grantor is asking for time, they're going to give them time. Me as a community person, right? (laughs) They don't have to say yes to me as much, but I do feel like there's still this obligation because we're Patagonia that we're going to say yes. But I think we're exploring kind of all of these different scenarios and figuring out how best to show up, when to be better about asking for time and for needs, that sort of thing moving forward and being very conscious of the fact that we are a funder. How do we invite trust-based and kind of equitable work and be fine when they say no, you know, even Mm. if we, so I think that we're in that kind of transition with our relationships in general, whether it's the granting team or the marketing team or, you know, whatever it may be, but we have a ways to go to figure that one out. But to me, ideally there is the strength comes from, it's a two way, Mm -hmm. it's a two way conversation, regardless of who we are. Mm -hmm. That's my hope. Yeah. I mean, what you're talking about is so complicated is like the inherent power dynamics, especially in, you know, a lot of the work I do, of course, is supporting nonprofit leaders to recognize their value at the table with funders, because what happens when they aren't aware of their value is this power dynamic where money is the only thing of value. And then there is this, you know, we know from the science that people in perceived positions of power have influence that they don't even recognize they have, that the person in a less powerful role is much less likely to push back on something. And that's like the science of influence. And so how do we change that? I don't know. Like that's for somebody else to figure out. For me, it's like, okay, so then how do we help fundraisers and organizations feel more powerful at the table, feel like they're holding something really valuable because once they know that in their core, then they're able to say, you know what, that's such a good idea, Whitney, but on that timeline, we can't make it happen. Could we do blank? Right. But that's such a hard thing to do. If the only value you see the the highest value and the biggest value you see in a relationship is the movement of the money. And that's only going in one direction. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And I, you know, secretly, I want them to say, we can't make those deadlines, right? Because (laughs) that's the only way we're going to shift our narrative, right? Mm -hmm. That's the only way we're going to be able to change the way we've been doing things is if there are more people that are like, that's, Mm. A lovely offer. No way in hell are we going to make it in two weeks, right? (laughs) So yeah, I think we need that. And absolutely. I mean, the whole reason we began granting, right, was because we saw value in what these small groups could do that we weren't able to do. And it's why we've continued to grant small kind of grassroots efforts more than just focusing on four of the top big greens type of thing. Mm. There is this belief that it is from the ground up and it is from kind of community local movements that will grow into kind of bigger, broader, more impactful efforts. Mm. So I think that, yeah, inherently for the groups to feel their value and live and speak their value will help us remember that when we have Mm. obscene deadlines that we're putting on people. And I think even there's small things I've seen with funders that can make a huge difference. I mean, even funders just saying things to their partners, like we're so grateful to be in partnership with you, or we really appreciate you letting us come in and support this project, like tiny little language nuances start to shift the mindset inside the organization to be like, okay, like they're just, you know, and those are uncommon things to hear inside the nonprofit sector. Like gratitude often goes one direction, right? It's like the money moves one way, gratitude moves the other way. And so as we start to shift some of those other dynamics, I think, I think it's really powerful. And I'm curious, the piece you said before about, okay, how do we build a trust-based relationship before there's an ask or before the money is on the table. And this is something I grapple with a lot because there's this conversation in the nonprofit sector around, you know, don't be transactional, be like transformational relationships. And I agree, don't be transactional. But I think we've made transactional mean talk about money. And what I think that 
leads to is this avoidance of a conversation around money that needs to be there from the beginning for the nonprofit safety of like, look, if you go in and what you really want is a longer term strategic partnership that helps you build X program. Sure. Maybe you're not going to make that ask right away, but being clear that like, that's where you're hoping to go instead of pretending like what you want to do is create a whole volunteer day program, you know, and, and then you're planning in 18 months to have them like that volunteer day program enough that then you can talk about this other thing. And so I really grapple with like this balance and coaching folks around this balance of like, it is important to not bury the lead because then what you're going to do is you're going to spend 18 months in a kind of half superficial relationship because you're not talking about the thing you're really hoping for ultimately for a number of different reasons, mostly because you see alignment there, not because money is the only thing of value. And then you find yourself kind of you know, not building real trust because it hasn't been on the table from the beginning. So I'm just curious kind of how you think about that. Like what's the balance between being clear that like, yeah, our ultimate goal would be that you would help us build this project or program, but what are ways for us to sort of play and navigate relationship earlier in this process to make sure there's that alignment and this is a good fit? Yeah. Um, I mean, it honestly, I like the thing that pops into my head is going to feel very tangential. So bear with me. I'm I'm in. (laughs) (laughs) So my dad was an English professor and both my brother and I like decided to take his class in college at one point. And my brother's five years older. So, you know, he got to give me the goods on what, how to show up for dad. (laughs) But I remember being in his class and working like, you know, working my ass off. And I was like a decent student. I was, Mm. school was not where I learned. I learned outside Mm. touching rocks and, you know, just being on indigenous lands and waters, but I worked my ass off in his class. And I remember like presenting one of my first drafts of a paper and trying to like, I was poetic as I could be, right? I was bringing in the metaphors and I was, you know, bringing in all of the, the lovely, like waxing poetic type things you do. (laughs) And he's like, Whitney, what are you trying to tell me? Like, just tell me what you want me to know. Mm. Right. And he's like, it's not about the flowery stuff. It's not about, you know, the, the Mm. metaphors, those will come if there's a right time and place for them. But like, what do you want me to know? And I feel like, Like that is the metaphor, right? For back to what you were just Mm -hmm. asking, where I feel like people don't have time to read through like scenarios and what ifs, like, Mm -hmm. what do you want us to know? Be upfront Mm -hmm. about that and be real on where you are in that journey. And I think we are used to reading lots of different proposals from small organizations that maybe don't have it figured out yet, but I would put money on the fact that the more real and the more focused and the more clear you can be on what you want from us, the better we'll be at reacting in a way Mm -hmm. that might be like, let us help you with that right writing of that proposal Mm -hmm. or come to a tools talk where we can get you some expert help or, you know, it it might not yield the dollars right away, but it's going to yield that trust-based relationship Mm -hmm. and longer term relationship that I think ultimately people are wanting both from our side of it, as well as from, the nonprofit side of it. So I feel like that's it, right? It's what do you want me to know? How do you want me to show up and support you? And being very clear on that mm-hmm. upfront is going to be better for everyone. Mm. I think that is such good advice because it saves everyone time. And it also allows people to say from the beginning, you know what, there isn't that kind of alignment here. The most we could see working together might be in this capacity if you're interested in that, but you know, Thank you for being upfront about the overall goal that actually isn't in alignment with our goals over here. And, you know, I think relationships and trust and all those things are obviously a really critical part, but I think when we don't talk about the alignment early, then it leaves way too much to just being like, do you like me? (laughs) Do you like me enough? And then we actually fall back into a lot of the like inequities in grant making practices. Right. Right. Well, and I've seen, I haven't necessarily been the one delivering the news, but I have been the person who's contacted when the group didn't get a grant to be like, Hey, 
What happened mm-hmm. here? And I've seen where our team is happy to have those conversations and to also be real back to the groups to say, hey, mm-hmm. this is why we did or did not grant you. Let us help you so that you can get a grant next time. Mm-hmm. So I think that there is this investment from our side. And I can't speak to funders outside of Patagonia, but there is this investment of, I feel like the more real you can be, the more you're going to want, or you're going to have people that want to help. So I think that there is that hope as we think about becoming more equitable and not only in our granting, but in our relationships in general, that will come with that kind of trust-based mm. growing because there's a starting point that is absolutely grounded in here's who I am right now. Might not mm. be perfect, but here's what I need from you. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I think that's just really helpful framing. And it's making me think back to something you said a few moments ago about the relationship between or how you select smaller organizations, grassroots organizations. And my guess is that those vary sort of in the length of time they've perhaps been around, whether or not there's been like the length of time the nonprofit itself has been around, not the wisdom, not the community, but perhaps the nonprofit itself has been around and a huge range in their demonstrated community impact to date. And I feel like there's this real sort of what comes first, the chicken or the egg situation sometimes in community impact, where one, we don't have a good sense of like the length of time it will take for us to see impact. And then it also can be hard to know sometimes, okay, this seems like the right group to really lead the charge here. They don't perhaps have the metric demonstration that our marketing team might want or, you know, the reach in that way. But is that because they haven't been funded appropriately to be able to build out those like elements of their organization? And so when you're thinking about the role that sort of Patagonia plays in community impact and partners play in community impact, how do you think about that intersection? Yeah, I think I got that right. I'm trying to think back through, we're changing our granting structure a little bit. And because I'm not on the granting team, I might butcher it a little. (laughs) A little bit, but (laughs) we have basically teams that are strategic grantors and really working with, we have kind of four core company pillars and one is climate change. One is focused on healthy lands and waters. One is focused on kind of agricultural transformation. And Mm -hmm. then one that is new to the company and we're still in the early phases of defining what this actually means is thriving communities. And Mm -hmm. so We have strategic grant program that works to support those kind of four pillars. Mm. And that's where our teams will kind of go actively search and invite people to apply versus kind of a general application. Mm. And so I feel like that there have been situations where looking at our climate program, for example, there's a lot of emphasis on kind of dismantling the fossil fuel industry Mm. and right working at that, really that intersection Mm. of social, racial, climate justice Mm. around the kind of needing to shift away from fossil Mm. fuels. And so there are groups that have been there forever, right? And I think Mm. we are doing some work with those groups that have been around and proven themselves and, you know, have that Mm. history. But there are groups that are also newer and newer coalitions that are starting. There's a group that is just down the street from our headquarters in Ventura, California, unceded Chumash territory, where they're kind of taking on the desire, I guess, for more oil and Mm -hmm. bigger companies to come in and develop the area. And it's one of those Mm -hmm. where the coalition that has formed is newer Mm -hmm. in consideration to some of the groups we've granted, but we've built out that connection and actually have Mm -hmm. a team member from our Enviro team that's a part of the coalition. And so while they're newer, you know, we've built relationships with them. So granting is much easier Mm -hmm. for us. I think groups that are maybe brand new and looking for grants, it really comes back to what we were just talking about. I think if there's a clear goal and there's a Mm -hmm. clear kind of path on what's needed, it's going to be easier for us to get behind that I think it's harder when groups just aren't really sure mm-hmm. you know, what they're trying to accomplish and maybe have like 
a little bit of all the right buzzwords, but mm. it's not really understood on their goals and timelines and what they need from us. So mm. I don't, yeah, I don't know if it's that we don't necessarily grant only groups that have been around forever. I think there's flexibility there, especially if they're tied to our pillars. And then kind of another program that we're working on is because we have so many retail stores across the whole country and in Canada, we're looking at building out how do we do more kind of community-based granting. And Mm. so again, that's going to look different for every retail team and group because obviously that community is going to be different. So what happens in Atlanta is going to be different, right, from what's going to happen in Seattle or Boulder Mm. or, you know, wherever it may be. And so I think those programs are going to be a little bit more exploratory and probably Mm. there will be room for groups that are still Mm. trying to figure it out because they might be value aligned with the stores and what we're trying to kind of do in each of those Mm. different areas. And we're trying to really learn from the groups that are there, the indigenous groups Mm. that are there. We're trying to build out relationships with indigenous communities and we can't Mm. go in assuming that everyone just wants money, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe they Mm -hmm. don't, maybe they want Mm -hmm. something totally different. So I think Mm -hmm. our community groups and grants will be slightly different from our strategic grants that are really based on our company pillars. So Mm. it's a little bit of an all over the place answer. But no, it's that- actually, it's fantastic. And I want to double click on something that you just said that I think is so important, which is that you also don't want to make the assumption that it's all about money for the nonprofits. And so I think that is just a really good kind of pin for me too, that as we shift thinking inside the nonprofit sector, that it's all about money, right? It's also that money has just been this kind of like overarching umbrella for these conversations when we think about cross-sector partnership, but there's so much else here. And I know I promised we weren't going to talk about grants and I've accidentally maybe touched too close to those. So I'm curious, like the grant piece aside, what does partnership, like not including the way you guys do granting, when you think about community impact and you think about like partnerships that you're building, what does that look like aside from grants perhaps? Yeah. You know, there's a couple of different ways. I think I'll answer that. And one is we have a platform called Patagonia Action Works. And essentially, I mean, it starts with money because you do have to be a Patagonia grantee to be on this Mm. platform. But the thing that goes beyond the money side of it is that The tools that we offer groups when they are part of ActionWorks are basically a response to them telling us what they need in addition to dollars. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times because they're smaller groups, it is access to Patagonia's social platform. If their Mm -hmm. message can reach our audience through Twitter and Facebook and, you know, some of these other sites, social sites of course that amplifies it, you know, 10 Mm. times the amount of the audience that they may normally have. So we do offer kind of paid, we'll pay for ads and kind of co-create ads with these groups that can be focused on an event or a petition or, you know, a film that's coming out, Mm. whatever it may be. So amplification is a big one. Another big one is the skilled base volunteering. So being Mm. able to bring in experts to our grantees virtually for free. Mm -hmm. So being able to make sure our groups have access to, you need a lawyer, let's get you a lawyer. You need Mm -hmm. a, you know, graphic designer, let's get you a graphic designer, Mm -hmm. kind of whatever they are most needing, being able to kind of match make in a lot of cases Mm -hmm. with professionals to these groups to help that happen. So the groups can stay focused on really their core and bread and butter, what they need to stay focused on. And then of course there is the money side as well. So it's really, being able to offer these other components Mm. has been really helpful for us Mm. and the groups. I think the thing that when I think about the deeper relationships I have, it's the fact that oftentimes I am the student when it comes Mm. to working and being with our nonprofit organizations, right? I love interacting with our groups because they are so dialed on the issue or, you know, the indigenous led Mm -hmm. side of it and how to do that or whatever it may be, they have been a part of the frontline fight forever. So I feel like I then get to take a backseat and actually just like learn from Mm -hmm. them 
and wanting to make sure that that is honored and valued just as much that sharing of information, which comes back to kind of that trust based side of it, right? Like we Mm. are, we have a lot to learn from our groups in a lot of ways. Mm. And so to me, being able to give them not only money, but skill based volunteering and amplification, that sort of thing in response to the fact that we get this, like we get to learn from them is Mm. invaluable for both of us. Mm. I really appreciate you talking about that. And I think that's been an ongoing theme of of a number of episodes around, you know, community-based wisdom and how oftentimes in sort of human-centered nonprofit work, folks come in and everyone thinks they're the expert. And you guys navigate a really nuanced balance between the fact that you have been doing direct work yourselves, both inside your business, right around some of these like primary issues. And so, but then how to honor the expertise in the field, in place, in community, and really know sort of when to step forward and when to step back. It sounds like it's something you guys are really in sort of conversation and learning about, which I think is just amazing. Yeah. My ego wishes we were further along in those conversations, (laughs) but we are at least open to talking about them. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I'm curious, you know, you have this sentence in your LinkedIn bio, but there's a lot, your LinkedIn bio might be one of my favorite LinkedIn bios ever. So hopefully everyone will go check it out. But you have this one sentence in there that I also really love. I think it might be right at the very beginning that says like, I hold space for people to come together and listen to one another so that we can work in unity for a more just and better world. And I'm curious We talk a lot here too about sort of how to build true empathy, like really see the world through someone else's lenses. And it sounds like that's what you're trying to create space for too, is this like it is an environment to really listen, hear, absorb the perspective of other people to create unity. And I'm curious, like when you think about holding space like that, across partnerships or inside Patagonia, what are some of the primary elements that you consider? Yeah, good question. That, you know, that sentence was my attempt at Simon Sinek's, you know, know your why or start with Mm. your why. And yeah, I'll have to go back. I feel like it still very much resonates, but I feel like that's something I need to Mm. kind of keep going back to. But I think in general, I mean, what has brought me to really feeling like we can't keep trying to do it alone and we're going to need people to come together is just the fact that I think I've tried to do it alone for a long time because life is just kind of Mm. delivered. You know, I lost my parents young. I think I've been kind of the Irish background, you know, scrappy Mm. mentality of I'm just going to create it because it's not there before. But I think I've also recognized the fact that we're not meant to do life alone, but we have become so siloed. And whether Mm. that's due to perversion of religion or whether that's white supremacy mindset that is still very prevalent Mm. or whether that is Ukraine and Russia right now. I mean, there's so many reasons, but how do we get through that? right? Like how that is in my, this is going to very belittle it. And I don't mean to belittle this, but I feel like that is such the ego mentality. Mm. And if you get down to it, I feel like the reason I got into marketing is because I recognized that I loved storytelling. And I loved the fact that I could sit down and talk to a stranger, we could start kind of telling stories, find a common ground. And all of a sudden, like you have this bond, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a small example, but I feel like that is doable, right? Mm -hmm. We can continue to storytell and find common grounds. And that can be a way that we start to bring people together more for the common good. Mm -hmm. And I have this vision. I spent some time in Afghanistan working with the women's cycling team. And since being there, I've had this moment of like, and I think I've told Duke this before, (laughs) like I have this vision of someday, like sitting at a dinner table, having a meal, which already, right. Having a meal, sharing drinks, right. Helps to break down some of these opposing forces, but 
being able to sit and commune together and having like an Afghan women cyclist and a Taliban soldier, right? Mm -hmm. Having these seemingly opposing forces is like a dream Mm -hmm. to be able to walk away where we've actually found those common grounds. And then it's like, you can't go back, right? You can't go Mm -hmm. back to the bullshit after you do that. And so I think I've come to recognize that that is what I can start to do more at Patagonia. It's what I feel like I already have been doing because quite often I am a conduit from BIPOC LGBTQ plus communities into the brand Mm -hmm. and out from the brand. And so I think if I can continue to kind of bring people together equitably and with this regenerative mindset in mind, that is my hope that I can help make the world a little bit better and a little more just. And so I think that that is the skill set I feel like I can offer that is somewhat uniquely mine. Not to say I'm, you know, there are plenty of people that are good at bringing people together, but that is something I've recognized and kind of been tapped on the shoulder to do over and over and over again. So that's kind of that reason for that quote at the beginning, because I do honestly believe that we got to get out of our own way and we got to figure out how to be in partnership with one another if we are going to ever survive this world and climate change. Mm. I couldn't agree more. And I got a huge wave of like chills when you said that piece around, you know, you can't go back. And so I just want to sort of like say that again, because I think what you're saying there is so important. Like once a relationship is built, once a story is told, you can't unknow what you now know. And the power of that is just tremendous. And you can't unfeel what you felt. And that is transformative. And so I'm really grateful. I'm really grateful for your time. I'm really grateful for this conversation. Where can folks find you or if you want to connect with them or not? (laughs) Um, And if you have any sort of final suggestions around if folks are out there and they're like, not just necessarily with Patagonia, but you've handled so many sort of marketing brand partnerships before folks are like, where do I even begin? If you have some parting wisdom. And then I also invite folks to highlight a nonprofit, although many funders do not want to pick just one, but if you do have an organization you'd like to highlight that invitation is on the table as well. I love that. Okay. Well, I mean, Folks can find me kind of at the typical social outlets, right? You mentioned LinkedIn. I'm not great at checking LinkedIn, but I am there. Instagram, Twitter, you know, those are those are all places. I, I would recommend if anyone is interested and has a skill to lend a nonprofit checking out Patagonia Action Works because that is just a phenomenal way to start kind of individually fulfilling your own desire to give more. It like, we'll be honest, it feels good to give, right? And to donate time. And quite often what could take a professional 30 minutes could take a nonprofit three months Mm -hmm. to do. So I think checking that out at Patagonia Action Works makes a lot of sense. It's hard to highlight a single nonprofit. I will say I have had the pleasure of getting to know some of the indigenous folks at the Wilderness Society lately. And there's a new initiative, the Imago Initiative, that I have had the privilege to learn a little bit more about, which is essentially a way of doing conservation that centers indigenous voices at the center and is a way of really rethinking at least for many groups in the outdoor space that are typically white led and focused on wild places versus people, the Imago initiative that wilderness society is bringing to life is transformational in my mind. So I'll call that out because I think it's such good work that anyone who is in conservation should consider how to do indigenous led and what that means for white organizations. So that's one There's so many others. Indian Collective is another one that I go back to all the time because of their knowledge, their indigenous knowledge, but it's hard to stop just there. I mean, (laughs) we are highlighting a number because it's Black Climate Week right now. Mm. So working with intersectional environmentalism, Mm. Leah Thomas, of course, that many people know and the Solutions Project is hosting Black Climate Week and we've loved doing work with them, but there's thousands. And I'm of course going to leave many groups out that I shouldn't. So I'm going to stop there and acknowledge there are so many good people and groups doing good work. 
No, thank you. I know that it's always the problem, but it's great to give those folks a shout out. And thank you so very much for this conversation. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. It's nice to see you. You too.